Energetic change during the course of a reaction is one of the most basic concepts in physical chemistry. Frequently, these changes are measured using calorimetry. There are many different types of calorimetry that can be used to look at a myriad of different processes. In this video, you will take a look at two different types of calorimetry, bomb and solution. These techniques will be used to learn about two different concepts, heat of combustion and heat of ionization. Let's start with the basics of calorimetry. These are concepts that are common to both experiments. The final goal of most calorimetry experiments is to determine either the change in internal energy, delta U, or the change in enthalpy, delta H, for a reaction. Both quantities are a measure of the energy difference between the products and reactants. In class, you will see that these two quantities are related by the simple expression H equals U plus PV, or delta H equals delta U plus the change in the quantity P times V. Useful relationships are found by fixing conditions. In a constant pressure experiment, delta H equals QP, the heat at constant pressure. If a constant volume is applied instead of pressure, delta U equals QV, the heat at constant volume. Heat can be measured by noting the basic relationship of Q equals C delta T, where C is the heat capacity and delta T is the change in temperature of the material. Simply speaking, the change in internal energy or enthalpy can be determined by measuring the change in temperature of a defined system with a known heat capacity. You will use this simple equation to learn about heat transfer in systems. The remainder of this video has three parts, bomb calorimetry, solution calorimetry, and data acquisition. You will measure the heat of combustion of naphthalene using bomb calorimetry, the type of constant volume calorimetry. In bomb calorimetry, a sample is burned under high pressure of oxygen in a rigid container. The internal pressure of the bomb can change greatly after ignition of the sample. In the history of this experiment, there are examples where the container used was not strong enough to deal with the pressure changes and exploded. This is where the term bomb probably derived. Modern bombs are constructed out of thick stainless steel and only rupture under the most extreme conditions. The combustion of naphthalene during your experiment is not under extreme conditions. Let's take a look at the bomb. When assembled, the bomb is an unimpressive closed cylinder made of stainless steel. The top is held on by a large retaining ring which screws off. On the top of the bomb there is a gas connector, a venting valve, and two electrical feed-throughs. Loosen the valve counterclockwise to vent the bomb to atmosphere. With the vent open, the top can be pulled up to remove from the body. You will notice there is an O-ring around the top. This O-ring is used to make a gas-tight seal in the bomb. The electrical feed-throughs and the gas inlet can be seen on the underside of the top. One of the electrical connections is bent into a circular shape. This is where the sample cup will sit. There's a sliding cover found on each connector about halfway down the connection. These covers will be used to secure the fuse wire when you assemble the bomb. First, you will make a pellet of your sample. The pellet will sit in the sample cup that will eventually go in the bomb. Weigh the sample cup on the analytical balance and record this mass. You can set this aside for a moment. Put the die into the bottom of the housing. Next, roughly measure out the required mass onto weighing paper and pour the sample onto the top of the die. Carefully, pick up the die assembly. You'll have to use a finger to keep the die and sample from falling out the bottom of the housing. You'll probably want to try to pick up the assembly a couple times without sample until you get the hang of it. Slide the die housing containing the die and the sample onto the press. Once in place, Press the lever down to form your pellet. If the press starts to come off the counter, you've definitely pressed hard enough. Raise the lever and carefully remove the die housing. Most likely the die will slide out smoothly and the pellet will be left inside the housing. Place the sample cup under the housing and gently place the die in the housing on top of the pellet. Slide the housing back onto the press and gently use the lever to press the die downward. This will allow the pellet to gently slide into the sample cup. Again, gently slide the housing off the press. The housing and the die can be removed. 
you should now have a nice sample pellet in the sample cup. Weigh the sample plus cup on the analytical balance. Calculate the mass of your sample by difference. Now you can put together the bomb. Cut approximately 10 centimeters of fuse wire. Weigh the fuse wire on the analytical balance. This is very important and easy to forget. Feed the ends of the fuse wire through the holes on the electrical connections and secure with the sliding covers. Place the sample cup with sample pellet into the holder. Gently, bend the wire so it makes good contact with your pellet. Be gentle or you will break the pellet. Make sure the wire doesn't touch the pan. Gently place the top of the bomb into the housing. Press the top all the way in. The O-ring should not be visible. Screw down the retaining ring until it is hand tight. It does not have to be Superman tight. Close the vent by twisting counterclockwise until it is finger tight. Again, Superman strength not required. Now you need to fill the bomb with a high pressure of pure oxygen. Before that, let's think for a minute about gas safety. Gases generally come in large steel cylinders. These cylinders are pressurized to near 3000 psi, which is roughly 200 atmospheres. A single main valve is all that separates the gas from the atmosphere. If the gas were released quickly, the result would be catastrophic. A great demonstration of this is found on Moodle, titled Air Cylinder Rocket. For this reason, gases have to be dealt with in a specific way. First, never move a gas cylinder without the protective cap. This cap screws on and can protect the main valve in the event of falling. If the cap is to be removed, the cylinder needs to be secured so that it cannot fall. In the lab, there are chains to secure the cylinders. With the cylinder secure and the cap removed, a regulator can be attached. The regulator is used to regulate the output pressure from the cylinder, generally to a much lower pressure than that of the full cylinder. On the regulator, there are two pressure gauges. One shows the pressure of the cylinder, and the other shows the pressure that is coming out of the regulator. Never move a gas cylinder while a regulator is still attached. With the regulator on the secured cylinder, the bomb can now be pressurized. Place the bomb into the holder on the bench next to the oxygen cylinder. Put the filling adapter onto the gas connection of the bomb. The gas connection contains a one-way valve, meaning that the valve is open and gas will flow into the bomb as long as the gas coming out of the regulator is at a higher pressure than the inside of the bomb. The valve will close when the pressure inside the bomb is greater than the pressure outside. Open the main cylinder valve by turning approximately one full turn. Slowly open the black needle valve. You will see the output gauge start increasing. Allow the bomb to fill to the desired pressure and then close the valve. Once you close the valve, the output gauge will drop. Therefore, you need to pay attention and close as soon as you have reached the desired pressure. Vent the fill line by opening the black toggle valve. If you don't remember to do this, there will be a quick gas release when you remove the gas connection. This can be loud. At this point, you should recognize the bomb contained some lab air before it was pressurized. These gases are still in the bomb and can lead to unwanted side combustion reactions. The gases need to be minimized before you can proceed. Slowly, open the vent valve. If you open it too fast, you can disturb your fuse. Immediately after the bomb has completed venting, close the vent valve. Repressurize the bomb. You now have a bomb ready to run. Release the pressure by using the black toggle switch and remove the filling adapter. With the bomb prepared, you can now prepare the calorimeter. Place the calorimeter pail into the calorimeter and the bomb into the calorimeter pail. Attach the leads from the igniter to the bomb. You now need to fill the pail with a known amount of water. Fill a flask with 2000 grams of room temperature water. Record the mass of the flask and water. Carefully pour the water into the pail avoiding spills and splashes. 
reweigh the empty flask to determine how much water is in the pail. Place the top onto the calorimeter, making sure that the stirrer turns freely and does not hit the sides. The other rod that goes into the pail is a precision thermocouple. You will read off the voltages of the thermocouple and convert these voltages to temperatures later. You will use a rubber band as a belt that will connect the stirrer to the motor. Once the belt is in place, turn the black knob to engage the motor and make sure the stirrer is turning. At this point, you are ready to start acquiring data. The bomb can be fired by pressing the igniter button after you've set up your data acquisition. If you're ready to learn about data acquisition, please skip ahead to the data acquisition section. You will measure the heat of ionization of glycine using solution calorimetry. Solution calorimetry is a type of constant pressure calorimetry. In solution calorimetry, a sample is released into a solution and the change in temperature is recorded. First, record the mass of an empty Dewar flask. Dispense a measured amount of your solution of interest into the Dewar and reweigh. Place the black retaining ring around the Dewar and place the Dewar and ring into the calorimeter housing. The sample to be released into the solution will be held in a sealed cell until you are ready to initiate the experiment. Start by carefully measuring, by difference, the required amount of sample in the sample cup on the analytical balance. Gently place the bell over the sample cup and press the bell onto the sample cup. The sample assembly can then be attached to the drive rod. Secure the sample cell of the drive rod by tightening the plastic screw on the coupling. The sample will be released into the solution by using a push rod to separate the cup from the bell as demonstrated here. Be careful with the push rod. It's made of glass and can break easily. Place the entire assembly into the doer and make sure it freely rotates. Put the precision thermocouple through the hole and into the doer. Next, slide the belt over both pulleys. Place the weight on the black top to keep the assembly from shaking. Gently slide the glass push rod down the center of the sample assembly, but do not push down on it. Press F1 to start the drive motor. You are now ready to start acquiring data. Once your run is complete, press Shift F1 to stop the motor. The voltage readouts from the calorimeter thermocouple are collected using a program written with LabVIEW software. This program is creatively called Calorimeter. Both experiments use the same thermocouple output and therefore you can use the same program for both bomb calorimetry and solution calorimetry experiments. The digital output of the precision thermometer is determined by setting the offset, used to set the baseline, and the span used to set the temperature range of the thermometer. The offset can be set by pressing star 124, enter, followed by the temperature you wish to use, followed again by enter. The span is set in a similar manner using star 122. Be sure to write down both the span and the offset for each change of either the span or the offset parameters throughout the experiment so that you can convert your data into temperatures. The most common problem in converting the data to temperature values is missing span or offset information. Without these values, you will not be able to complete your lab write-up and will have to redo the entire experiment. The conversion from voltage to temperature can be found in the lab handout. Initially, set the span to 0.05 degrees and the offset to a value such that the measured temperature is approximately 0.025 degrees above the offset. In other words, you want to start data collection in the middle of the range. Open the calorimetry program from the Applications folder. To start the data collection, 
click on the white arrow button at the top left of the window. In the pop-up window, type in a file name and save. If you do not save the file, you will not have any data at the end of your experiment. At the prompt, click the Ready button. The program will begin to collect thermocouple voltages and display a real-time readout. Your new file will log these data and you can verify during a run. To stop data collection, click on the red button. Do not save again. Before and after the reaction, you should obtain a constant slope on the temperature recorder for at least five minutes. If needed, adjust the offset to keep the data on the screen. Data that goes off the top or the bottom of the screen is not recorded. Once you have attained a constant slope for five minutes, you can initiate your run. For bomb calorimetry, you will press the igniter button. For solution calorimetry, you will depress the rod. See your handout for details on what span you will need for your experiment. In your experiment, are you measuring delta U or delta H? Explain. Why do you need to record both the span and offset each time you change either parameter? What is the purpose of the regulator? Why do you need to be careful with the push rod? Mm -hmm.